This is an overview of Dr. Seuss Enterprise v. Penguin Books, decided in 1997 by the United States Court of Appeals, Ninth Circuit. The plaintiff, Dr. Seuss Enterprises, filed suit against Penguin Books and Dove, Inc. after seeing an advertisement for a book called The Cat Not in the Hat, a parody by Dr. Juice. This book was summarizing the events around the O.J. Simpson trial. The Cat Not in the Hat employed a similar rhyme scheme, thematic elements, and characteristics of the well-known Cat in the Hat character. Defendants were not authorized to use any element from the Dr. Seuss books, nor did they seek permission. The plaintiff filed suit for copyright and trademark infringement, a temporary restraining order, which was denied by lower courts, and the preliminary injunction that prevented publication and distribution of the book in its entirety. And on March 21, 1996, the district court granted this injunction and enjoined the distribution of 12,000 books. Penguin and Dove appealed to the Ninth Circuit, claiming the affirmative defense of fair use as a parody. The question addressed in this case is whether The Cat Not in the Hat is a parody work protected under the Fair Use Doctrine. The plaintiff first had to prove ownership of copyright and the infringement on one of the five exclusive rights. Valid ownership was confirmed through registration certificates. Next, Seuss must demonstrate the substantial similarities of expression between the two works. To determine if the substantial similarities exist, the court adopted methodology originating from the Sid and Mark Croft Television Productions versus McDonald's Corp. The first question, called the extrinsic test, asks if there are similarities in both ideas and expressions, and uses analytic dissection to determine which elements are copyrightable before further examination. The second question, the intrinsic test, asks if an if an ordinary reasonable person would detect similarities between the two items in question when treated as a whole. Considering the following elements individually, the title, font design, illustration style, and poetic style of the two works are not copyrightable, so their similarities would not qualify as infringement. However, the lower court granted injunction based on the back cover illustrations and the cat's hat, not on these elements, so the court did not overturn the district court's findings. Despite the strong showing of infringement based on the use of the cat's hat and the back cover illustration, Penguin and Dove insisted that the cat not in the hat is a parody, therefore it's all in fair use. The court evaluated the four factors of fair use to determine if the factor use defense exists. The defendants argued that the book was a parody, thus a form of social and literary criticism that could be protected under the fair use doctrine as a transformative work. The court cited the definition of a parody as determined by the Supreme Court in the Campbell A. Cuff Rose music case that a parody that uses copyrighted elements from another's work must comment on that author's work. It may not simply use copyrighted material to get attention or avoid being creative. The key here is the content that is borrowed must be in part the object of the parody. As was the case in Rogers versus Coons, you cannot mimic a style of work without parodying what you borrow from. So, was the cat in the hat, cat not in the hat a parody? The court decided no. While the book mimicked the style of Dr. Seuss, it simply applied the Seuss style to the retelling of the OJ trial, making no comment on the cat in the hat itself. The court did not find use of Dr. Seuss elements to provide a new expression, meaning, or message. Thus, factor one weighs in favor of the plaintiff against fair use. The second factor, while not as significant, seeks to uphold the main intention of copyright law in protecting highly creative works. The court found that the creativity, imagination, and originality of Dr. Seuss's work weighed against fair use. The third factor looks at the amount and substantiality of the portion used. The court found that the cat's image on the front back covers, as well as the cat's hat, were appropriated without consent. Because this imagery was the highly expressive core of Dr. Seuss's work, this weighs against fair use. The court turned its attention to the defendant's justification for using the cat in the hat. 
authors Katz and Wren insisted that the cat in the hat was the perfect vehicle to comment on the Brown Goldman murders and the O.J. Simpson trial. The authors used the cat in the hat to, com to comment on the frivolousness of society's reaction to the murders and trial and to parody Dr. Seuss's story of a whimsical trickster character that causes mayhem but magically cleans it up at the end, leaving a moral dilemma in his wake. This defense did not convince the court, and they agree with the district court that their fair use defense is pure shtick and that their post hoc characterization of the work is completely unconvincing. Finally, the court evaluated the potential market harm caused by publication and distribution of the cat not in the hat because the cat in the hat was deemed non or the cat in the hat, not in the hat was deemed non-transformative with commercial purposes it was determined that market harm may be readily inferred unfortunately penguin and dove failed to submit evidence on this factor that would have served their case this in turn disentitled them from relief from the preliminary injunction they appealed. Another matter of discussion in this case was trademark infringement. The purpose of a trademark is to prevent customer confusion. As such, determining trademark infringement is not focused on the appropriation of an idea or expression. It instead focuses on determining if there is a likelihood of confusion in the marketplace. So in this case, would a consumer mistake the cat not in the hat as a Dr. Seuss product because of its usage of familiar Dr. Seuss elements? This question is answered using the eight-factor sleek craft test shown. After evaluating these factors, the court agreed with the findings of the district court that some of these factors are indeterminate because the book was never published or, or publicly distributed, leaving serious questions for litigation. Another point made by the court is that claiming something as a parody is not a viable defense in trademark infringement claims. Non-infringing parodies should be amusing, not confusing. The court cites Hard Rock Cafe licensing versus Pacific Graphics, stating, quote, the claim of parody is no defense when the purpose of similarity is to capitalize on a famous mark's popularity for the defendant's commercial use. Considering the defendant's intent was certainly to capture the market's attention using Dr. Seuss's style in order to stand out among other O.J. Simpson trial books, this defense falls flat. The court stated that the existing reputation of the cat in the hat outweighed the defendant's expenses in producing the 12,000 books. The injunction was also reviewed to determine if it were unreasonable. Penguin and Dove went forward with the book production after Seuss initiated the action, and as a result, they could not alter the final product to eliminate the infringing elements. Thus, the preliminary injunction order was left as is. In conclusion, the defendant's appeal was denied. The court found no reason to overturn the preliminary injunction that prohibited the publication and distribution of the cat not in the hat. So here are the questions that were posted on the forum. Um, the first question is from Eric, which focused on the sleek craft test that was used to determine the likelihood of confusion. And he asked if, since there was no solid evidence of confusion, um, do I think that such confusion would exist to support a claim of trademark infringement? So to reiterate, factors four, five, and six, and eight were all found indeterminate because the cat not in the hat was enjoined from distribution. Um, and after some thought, I think that yes, there could be some confusion based on the intended cover art. I imagine if this book was displayed prominently in a bookstore uh, due to its relevance with the news at the time, that a person could presumably make make the mistake that this is an actual Dr. Seuss book and purchase it for their child, regardless if they actually found it in the children's book section. And on that same note, a bookstore employee might mistakenly place this book in a children's section, creating opportunity to harm the sale of real Dr. Seuss books, as well as potential harm to a child that might read this. Um, question two was from Nicole, who asked, what kind of tests are done to determine if a work is being critical enough of modern society 
or of other work. Um, so her question revolved around the judge's determination that the defense was pure shtick. Um, when I first read this question, I thought that I didn't really pick up on the court saying that the cat not in the hat was unsuccessful in providing criticism of the OJ trial, but rather that their use of the cat in the hat elements was just simply unwarranted. Um, I remember reading in Blanche versus Coons that the quote, the court said it wasn't their job to judge the quality of art. And they cited um, Blystein versus Donaldson lithographing company saying, quote, it would be a dangerous undertaking for a person trained only to the law to constitute themselves final judges of the worth of a work. So to me, to answer your question, I think that the threshold for criticism is probably as low as the originality requirement in copyright law, but for this case, the evaluation of the fair use factors and the sleek craft test made any excuse the defendants had in the name of parody weaker than their actual uh, criticism of society. So the third question comes from Lillian, and she asked, why would Penguin and Dove go ahead and complete the production of the book if they knew that legal action was going to be brought against them for only a few specific elements? And was it worth it? So I think this is a great question because if Penguin and Dove had stopped production at the time, they may have reduced the injunction to a partial enjoyment instead of the full book. And I'm honestly unsure why they would choose to proceed but uh, considering how in the J.K. Rowling case, Vander Art had initial hesitations in publishing the lexicon, but his lawyer reassured him that it was fine after he said, oh no, I looked into it, it's totally fine. I kind of could assume that maybe the lawyers that Penguin and Dove used reassured them that the fair use defense was bulletproof and that there was no risk in proceeding with their original production schedule. Um, I would say it's definitely not worth it. Uh, since the book was not published and is not really available. Um, and I'm very curious as to what other students think about this question.